Hello everyone, welcome to the Powerplay Chess channel with coverage of the fourth round of the Meltwater Tour final held in San Francisco at the moment. And as you probably know, the world champion Magnus Carlsen is on fire after defeating Wesley So, Arjun Irigaisi and um, Shahiyam Mamadiarov. Today it was um, Anish Giri's turn to get a 3-0 uh, loss uh, to deal with against the world champ. So let's have a look at, uh, at the most fascinating game, in my opinion, the world champion playing with the white pieces against the uh, Anish Giri's uh, Grunfeld defense. So it's 1d4, knight of 6, c4, g6, knight c3, d5, and Magnus goes for the exchange variation. All very well-known uh, theory, of course. And Magnus goes for a very uh, interesting setup with uh, the move bishop e3. And now after c5, put a rook on c1 to get the rook out of the long diagonal, trying to strengthen the center. And uh, well, it's one of the popular systems to, uh, to play uh, as, uh, as white. Magnus himself played it in the, in the tour against uh, Pragnananda with, uh, with the black pieces. So after castling kingside, knight f3, bishop g4, bishop e2. Queen a5, up to this point we have been following that uh, aforementioned uh, game in which Prague uh, played the move uh, castle kingside, ready to sack the pawn on uh, a2. Typical uh, play of course, uh, white will try to generate some uh, activity in the center, probably push uh, the pawn to d5 at, uh, at some point. But true to his style, Magnus uh, plays the move queen d2. Not willing to give up the pawn on uh, on a2, uh, protecting it with uh, the queen. And one of the ideas is that the most natural move here, uh, knight c6, can just be met by d5. And after the knight goes away, we are planning to go c4. And white has a very nice uh, pawn center. And uh, that's one of the reasons of uh, white uh, placing the rook on, on c1, uh, so that the rook will never be, uh, be hanging. In any case... Giri uh, played here the move knight d7, and uh, well, of course, d5 is a possibility here, but black has a very strong counter response with the move c4, not allowing y to occupy the center with uh, the c pawn as well. The point being that the pawn cannot be taken because of rook c8, hitting the bishop on c4. If the bishop goes away, then the pawn on c3 uh, will be hanging. Of course, the, the pawn doesn't have to be taken, but then Black is uh, considering to, uh, to put a knight on uh, c5 at, uh, at some point with very interesting counterplay in, uh, in the center. So Magnus doesn't go for the line with d5, instead plays here the move uh, h3. Clarifying the, uh, the situation in the center, Black is forced to trade off the, uh, the bishop for the knight. So bishop takes f3, bishop takes f3, and here uh, Black play the move knight b6. Interesting idea as the knight is uh, intending to come to c4, at least that's what I would have uh, expected. White castled. And now, uh, up to this point, we have been following uh, one uh, predecessor a game between uh, Spanish uh, players Candela Perez and Iescas Cord Cordoba, played in Burgos 2003. In that game, there followed the most natural move, knight c4. Queen e2, and now black want to uh, take the, the bishop, uh, aiming for simplifications. And, well, we have a typical position in which black is objectively speaking uh, doing pretty well. But I wouldn't be surprised if Magnus had been aiming for such, uh, such a game. It's, uh, it's equal, but it doesn't mean it's a draw. Both sides have their, their chances. And, uh, well, one of the ideas for white here is that if the pawn would be taken, then we are ready to play e5. Bishop on g7 is out of play, bishop on f3 is doing a quite a nice job, and given the chance, uh, white will seriously consider marching with the d-pawn, create a passed pawn, and, uh, well, a lot, of, uh, lot uh, to play for in, in such a case. But this didn't happen, and Giri uh, had another idea in mind, and um, decided, instead of playing knight c4, to take on d4, which is a, a forcing sequence, Initiating the um, the exchange of uh, of queens, so queen takes d2, bishop takes d2, and now the pawn on d4 is uh, is taken. White center is gone, but as compensation, the rook is now able to enter 
on the seventh rank, and the pawn on um, uh, the seventh rank will be uh, will be regained. Critical moment because he, still I, I believe Black is in a quite okay shape. If he would uh, decide here to to play a move like e6, just keeping the the pawn structure symmetrical, Black is willing to return the the b pawn. Um, Okay, White's Rook looks uh, pretty uh, unpleasant, but uh, with a move like Knight A4, intending to uh, to put a Bishop on B6, Knight C5, the Rook is almost trapped. After that, we are able to offer the exchange of Rooks, and Black is uh, Black is uh, quite okay in that case. Uh, we don't have to fear the absence of the the Bishops guarding the King on the King side because Queens have been exchanged, and that explains why that maneuver with the Bishop going to B6. Is, um, is quite uh, playable for black. But Giri had uh, a different idea in mind. Instead of playing e6, he wanted to play it as active as possible with the move rook fc8. After rook takes e7, his idea was to enter himself with the rook on the second rank, hitting the bishop, hitting the pawn on a2 and keeping an eye on the pawn on f2 as well. Magnus played bishop f4. Rook takes a2, and now, interesting moment, the pawn on b7 could have been taken here, but Magnus is aiming for uh, activity with the move e5. And I like this, this move quite a lot, as it does activate uh, the bishop, uh, pressurizing the, uh, the pawn on b7. But there are also ideas based on uh, e6, trying to open up the, uh, the seventh rank, weaken uh, the, the kingside uh, formation. And... The fact that Giri went astray at, at this point explains that the position is quite uh, difficult to uh, to handle for uh, for Black. What Black probably should do now is uh, play something like Rook uh, Rook A5, and um, well, Rook takes B7 is a possibility. And well, you 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 got to be careful because Bishop takes E5 is not possible. Uh, after Bishop takes Rook takes E5, there is Rook takes B6, which is a tricky move as um, the rook on a8 is hanging and white is, uh, white is a piece up. Instead of uh, that um, bishop takes uh, e5 move, there are other possibilities. Probably rook, rook e8 is, uh, is one of them, intending to, to win the pawn on e5. And it looks pretty, uh, pretty equal in that case. Another interesting idea, and very typical for uh, such positions, is to play the move e6, as I mentioned. After f takes e6, I wish I could play here the move bishop g4, and then things start to look pretty uh, dangerous for uh, for black. But fortunately for him, there is still the move knight d5, attacking both the rook and the bishop. If you do take on e6, king h8, and uh, because of the knight fork, white is forced to trade off the bishop for the knight. But then black has no problems uh, whatsoever. The a pawn is actually uh, quite a force to reckon with. Instead uh, of playing bishop g4, probably bishop d2 is an interesting uh, alternative. Hitting the rook, sidestepping the knight fork on d5, and well, at the moment you're two pawns down, but there's quite, uh, quite some play here still if you manage to get in uh, bishop g4. Anyway, this didn't happen, and um, instead Giri played here the move king f8, but as it turns out, the king is very poorly placed on uh, on f8, but we will soon see why. First, the pawn on um, on b7 is uh, is captured, and here rook e8 was uh, Black's idea, attacking the pawn on e5, but very likely also preparing to consolidate its position with rook e7, initiating the exchange of rooks. So, okay, bishop takes e5 is one idea. White can never really play rook e1 to protect the pawn on e5 because of bishop takes f2. But now, critical moment of the game, and this is certainly a uh, fa fascinating maneuver which had been underestimated or just simply overlooked by, uh, by Anish. As Magnus came up with an incredible resource of uh, activating uh, the light squared bishop to another diagonal because frankly speaking the bishop has done its job on this diagonal there's nothing else to gain there but bishop d1 is a fantastic move with the idea of going to b3 attacking the rook on a2 and of course at the same time hitting the pawn on uh, on f7 and well as it turns out there are quite a lot of problems to uh, to deal with here for uh, for black because first of all if you would take the pawn on e5 
there is bishop to b3 and uh, well you cannot simply uh, take on uh, on f4 because we are going to take first on f7 with the rook with check king has to go to g8 then we take the bishop with the discovered check as well and now after king h8 we take on a2 and uh, white is just a full rook up so what should black do uh, instead well there are a couple of other moves and uh, in the game, uh, Giri decided to uh, to play the move rook b2 to cover the, the b3 square uh, so that the bishop cannot go there. But one other interesting move to uh, to discuss here is the move rook to e7 to uh, try to force the exchange of rooks, neutralize the, the potential pressure against the pawn on f7. But there is a forcing sequence now. Bishop h6 is the key move, trying to deflect the king from protecting the rook. King has to go to e8 to keep the rook defended. And now rook b8 check. King d7. And now bishop g5. The bishop hits the rook. Rook e8 is not possible uh, on account of bishop g4. And the king has to uh, release the protection of the rook. And of course f5 is not a way to stop the check because of the en passant rule. So after bishop g5, rook takes e5. Is, uh, is the only move, but now bishop f6, again, a very annoying uh, pin to, uh, to deal with, as, uh, for instance, if you decide to defend the, um, uh, the bishop on d4 with, with rook d5, there is simply rook d8 uh, with a nice uh, skewer. After uh, king c7, you can simply take on d5, knight takes d5, and bishop takes d4, white is a piece up. And if you try to keep the rook defended with the king, so that after the exchange of uh, rooks, the, the king also defends the bishop, well, then we can take on d4, for instance, uh, which does win a piece, because after rook takes d8, there is bishop b3 check. King has to go away, king f5, and rather than taking the rook on a2, because the bishop on d4 is hanging, white first takes with the bishop on uh, b6, removing the bishop from the threat now both rooks are just hanging and whatever uh, black does on the next move one of the rooks can just be uh, can just be captured so white remains uh, a piece up so that's basically what happens in case of uh, in case of rook e7 apart from rook b2 rook a3 is another interesting move but then again we will get to see the same maneuver as in the game as the other bishop comes back to c1 uh, to hit the bishop and try to gain access to the b3 square. So, for instance, if you would play rook a5, there is bishop h6 check first, king goes to g8, and now bishop b3 is a very unpleasant move to, to face because bishop takes f7 with a double attack is the threat. If you try to, to neutralize that uh, pressure against f7 with knight d5, we have rook d1 and uh, black is simply unable to... Um, to cope with all the uh, all the threats so instead of rook a5 maybe rook d3 could be considered but now bishop e2 is a very uh, clever uh, move as the rook is running uh, short on uh, squares let's say if you go rook b3 there is bishop c4 and white get exactly what it wants um, by uh, setting up this double attack as the knight is pinned cannot take the, uh, the bishop on c4 as the rook will be taken if you play rook c3 instead, we have bishop b2, and that's another skewer hitting the rook and the bishop. Rook got to move away. Rook c2, counterattack against the two bishops. Bishop takes d4, rook takes e2, and now rook a1 is a very, a very nice uh, move with the idea to take on a7 with massive threats against the pawn on f7. Very difficult to defend. Rook e7 will be met by bishop c5. Very nasty pin. And if you instead play, let's say, knight to c8, then we switch our um, mind by not going for the a-pawn, but rather put a rook on c1, intending to enter on uh, c7. And if you put a knight on e7, then the rook comes in to, to the seventh rank. The knight is pinned, cannot move, as otherwise f7 would be hanging. And then, well, bishop uh, c5 will be played at some point. Well, first, probably we got to defend the pawn on e5, so that rook takes e5 is not a defense. But in any case, black remains under pressure in this endgame. Let's go back to the game. But 
I thought these lines were too cool to uh, to not to include them. So after bishop to d1, there followed rook to b2, protecting the um, the b3 square. So the bishop cannot go there, but uh, of course, not rook takes uh, a7. There will be bishop takes e5 with a pretty even uh, game. But instead, bishop to c1. How fantastic is that? Two consecutive moves, bishop d1 and then bishop c1 back. The rook is in trouble. Um, if you would play rook to b4 to keep the b3 square covered, there is um, bishop to a3 with a very unpleasant pin. And if you would play rook to b5, also trying to keep the square covered, there is bishop to a4 with another skewer as uh, black cannot take with a knight as the rook on b5 would be hanging. Well, basically the same happened in the game. There followed rook b1, but we start with uh, the move bishop to, uh, to c2. Uh, in the game there followed uh, rook to b5 and then bishop a4 um, is a possibility. Just want to mention that rook a1 is uh, also not possible on account of uh, bishop h6 check, king g8. Even now the rooks can just be exchanged and then bishop to b3. And look how helpless black is covering the f7 square. Black's pieces are out of play. Bishop takes f7 is a big threat, cannot be protected by the rook or, or any other piece. So white is uh, simply winning here. Anish played here rook to b5. And now first a check on h6 to make sure the king goes to uh, to the corner. Cannot get uh, as, uh, escaped any uh, any time soon. But now bishop a4 is played and the loss of uh, material is simply inevitable. Knight takes a4, rook takes b5. Black is not even able to take the pawn on e5 here. Rook takes e5 is met by rook b8 with the back rank mate, which uh, now uh, clarifies the, uh, the point of inserting that bishop uh, check on, uh, on h6. So that's not possible. If bishop takes e5, then we can simply play rook e1 with another uh, very unpleasant uh, pin. Bishop h2, discover check. Doesn't really work here because of uh, take the bishop, rook e1, and rook b8 is made again. Instead, you, you could play something like f6, but that's a, that's a really weakening move of the king. The simplest move here is rook a5, with the idea to, uh, to take the pawn on a7. The, the seventh rank has been weakened, so that looks like it's uh, game over. There followed knight c3 instead, rook to b7. A5, so black is looking for counterplay, but it's way too slow. Rook e1 is a, is a good move. With the point that after a4, Magnus is aiming for simplifications with the move of bishop e3. Um, bishop takes e5, run, uh, runs into bishop to d4 with an attack on the bishop. Bishop cannot take on d4 as uh, there is a pin. Bishop takes c3 is also a threat. If you do take on d4, the simplest way to convert is rook e8, king g7, and rook e7. The a pawn is not dangerous at all. And one interesting line could be, let's say, black tries to run with a pawn. You take the pawns on f7 and h7. And then we are ready to give back one exchange. So that after bishop takes a7, rook takes a7. Well, black can place the pawn on a2, but now the knight is unable to move. White has the simple plan of uh, bringing up the pawns on, on the king side and, uh, well, eventually black, uh, black should crack. So that's bishop takes e5. If you do take with a rook on e5, by the way, there is rook b8 check, forcing the king to go to g7. Now we can safely take with a bishop on d4 as the rook is pinned. No time for black to take the rook on e1 himself. Anish therefore decided to take on e3, but after rook takes e3, now the bishop is gone. Um, White is threatening to take the knight, the knight got a move, went back to uh, to d5. And after rook f3, well, Anish had seen enough here. Like rook takes um, f7 is, uh, is a huge uh, threat with two rooks on the 7th, it, it's likely leading to mate. And after, let's say, uh, knight e7, probably the cleanest way here to proceed is rook f6, with ideas to go e6, put a rook behind the pawn, well, it's pretty much game over. It's something you don't really want to uh, to test the world champion to uh, to see if he's able to uh, to convert. So I thought this was a fantastic victory, 3-0 clean sweep. 
in favor of the of the world champ and um, well it doesn't happen so often that he's defeating his uh, most uh, strongest uh, opponents in the world in such a convincing manner thanks to these two fantastic moves bishop to d1 followed by bishop c1 hope you enjoyed it and see you soon again on the power play chess channel thank you bye bye